Guys, it is an honor to be with you. Um, my name is Matt Carter. I'm the pastor of preaching here at the Austin Stone, and uh, we're excited you guys came today. If you brought a Bible, um, open up to the book of Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. We're going verse by verse through the book of Matthew together, and um, we'll get there in just a second. We, uh, we talked a couple weeks ago about how Jesus spent almost three years um, in his earthly ministry. And of those three years of his earthly ministry, he spent the majority of that time not preaching about the gospel. In other words, he didn't walk around preaching about how he would die on a cross to pay the penalty for our sins, but he spent the majority of that time preaching about the gospel of the kingdom. Um, in other words, he, would pre- he was preaching, he'd show up in places and he'd preach this good news that a new kingdom had come and that he was the king of that new kingdom. And so Jesus begins in Matthew chapter 5, um, what's known as the Sermon on the Mount. He's by the Sea of Galilee. He's up on the side of the, the mountain there. He's got a crowd around him, and he begins to preach. And at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, he begins by uh, giving us this list of things that have become known as the Beatitudes. And what the Beatitudes are, um, and hear this, the Beatitudes are kind of a list of attitudes, and they're a list of attributes of the people that make up the new kingdom. He's saying this is what, um, as a new kingdom citizen, you're gonna do. This is what a new kingdom citizen is going to look like and how they're gonna behave and how they're gonna live. And so for us today, it's important as we go through these together over the next few weeks that you don't just look at a beatitude and say, okay, that's cool, that's what that means, that's great, and that moves on, and you move on. But really, it's important for you to ask yourself the question, do I see this attitude, do I see this action occurring in my life, because Jesus said, this is what new kingdom citizens are going to do. And so that's kind of the first thing he's doing with the Beatitudes is he's describing believers. He's describing the attitudes and actions of a new kingdom citizen. The other thing Jesus is doing, um, which I've really just got my brain around kind of in my old age, is that Jesus is showing these new kingdom citizens, which are you and me, what the path to real happiness is what the path to real happiness is. Every one of the Beatitudes starts with the word blessed. Blessed is the poor in spirit. Today we're gonna look at blessed at those who mourn. That word blessed is a word that means fully satisfied or it means happiness. It's, it's It's a word that means the highest expression of human satisfaction and happiness. So fully satisfied, happier people that do this. Fully satisfied and happier people that do that. Jesus is showing you and me as believers the pathway to the highest level of human happiness and satisfaction. Now that's important because what I'm realizing in my old age is that all of us are trying to find happiness. I mean, there is not a person in the room today that's not looking for happiness. There's nobody who would go, no, that's not what I want. And what Jesus does is he shows up on the scene and he says, here's what happiness looks like. Here's the path for New Kingdom citizens. Now, I went to la- last week, I, I wasn't here. I went to West Campus and, um, because they opened up a new building. And I got to be there for that. And I got to hear their pastor over there at West Campus, Ross Lester, preach. He's a great preacher. And, and um, one of the things that he, he did was he talked about that one of the proofs that we're all in this pursuit of happiness is the social media platform, Instagram. He's like, that's proof that we're all searching for happiness. And then there's a quote that I wanna give you from Ross Lester. A lot of our preachers quote C.S. Lewis. I'm gonna gonna quote Ross Lester here, all right? Um, He said this, it's brilliant. He said, if Twitter is a platform of total depravity, reeling everything that's wrong in the world, which is true, it is. He said, then Instagram is a parade of prosperity demonstrating all that we have in the world that's good. Isn't that good? That's brilliant. Draw on the money. It even sounded more brilliant in a South African accent, right? Instagram is a parade of prosperity demonstrating all in the world that's good. And he talked about how one of the evidences that Instagram is kind of this um, parade of human happiness, he talked about how often the word or the hashtag blessed shows up on Instagram. And so he looked it up. And there's 99.4 million times that the hashtag blessed shows up on Instagram. 
And, um, and so I decided to go look uh, at the search engine on Instagram and type in the hashtag blessed, which is a monumental mistake. Don't do it. Um, because, uh, like, I just looked at one page of it, but 99% of every single Instagram, you know, picture that has hashtag blessed on it is a girl in a bikini. I did not know that there was so much blessing in being a bikini, but there's obviously a lot of blessing there. And, and so, but I did find three pictures, there's a couple of babies and a lot of bikinis, and then there's three pictures in the first page that weren't a baby or a bikini. And I want to show you the first one here. Um, here we go. Y'all ready? Back there. Here we go. Um, jamming buttermilk waffles from scratch, no filter, just love. Quality ingredients, homestyle food, we jamming cafe, best part of waking up, hashtag blessed, right? And so obviously you're blessed if you eat waffles. Here's the, here's the number two one that wasn't a bikini or a baby. It's uh, Lamborghinis. Um, different, different generation of Lambos, what's your choice of bull to drive? They have no idea what that means. Lam Lamborghini, performance, Countach, hashtag blessed. And so obviously not one Lamborghini is a blessing, but two, you've crossed over in the blessing. And uh, in the last one here, I didn't write any of his hashtags. For some reason, it got cut off, but I think the picture's gonna speak to it for itself. Here's the third one. Here it is. This is like a real dude. And he's in a real uh, Halloween costume, and the last hashtag, he said, blessed, because obviously with that kind of hair, you're, you're, you're blessed, right? Um, and so <laughs> this is how the world defines happiness. This is it. They're, they're, you know, they're saying this, this is what blessing looks like. Now, here's the thing. I love waffles. I really do. Waffles make me happy. I love Lamborghinis. Um, I'm sure it would make me happy. I'm never going to find out, but I'm sure it would. Um, and, and I'm not going to lie to you, and I'm just going to blow your mind because I'm a pastor, um, and so it's going to freak you out, but I'm not going to lie to you. If I'm, if I'm at a beach by myself with my wife, her wearing a bikini makes me happy in Jesus' name. It really does. And, and so, but here, here's the problem. So I'm not saying any of that's wrong or that those things aren't blessings. That's not at all what I'm saying. The problem is, is, is that lasting happiness can't be found in those things. They work for a little while. And then that, that blessing sort of diminishes and goes away. And Jesus shows up on the scene a couple thousand years ago, and he preaches this sermon where the whole point of it is that the stuff of the world is temporary. And it might be a blessing now, but there's not a lasting blessing, and it's not the highest level of blessing. And then he gives this list of these attributes and these actions and makes the claim that these are, in fact, the highest level of human um, blessing and experience of happiness. Those are the Beatitudes, okay? Last week, he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I'll briefly touch on that in a minute, but let's go to the second one today. Matthew chapter five, verse four. <laughs> Jesus said, second Beatitude, he said, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And so, so here's literally what Jesus just said. He said that the highest form of human blessing and happiness is found when you mourn. Now, church, that's a crazy statement. Go on Twitter and just type that out. The highest form of human blessing uh, and happiness you can experience is when you mourn. And just watch the responses. I don't think very many people are going to agree with you. To the world, happy are those who mourn is a ridiculous statement. To the world, mourning is literally the opposite. It's an antonym of happiness. The, to the world, mourning is something that you avoid at all costs, and yet Jesus says, hey, for you and for me, for New Kingdom citizens, there is a level of blessing, and there's a level of happiness that can only be experienced on the other side of mourning. Okay, so what does that mean? That's a bold statement. So what does it mean? Well, here's the thing um, that you got to understand is that I think there's probably two meanings to this. Most scholars um, will say it's one or it's the other. I, I honestly believe it's both because I've, I've seen both be true in my life. And so I'm going to give you both meanings for what I think Jesus is saying here, that blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. So the first meaning of the phrase, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted, um, I, I think what Jesus is saying is that there's a blessing and there's a comfort that can be experienced by Christians when they mourn that cannot be experienced by people that are not 
new kingdom citizens. That, there's, there, that we have access to a comfort in our mourning that non-believers simply don't have access to. And so let's talk about death for just a second. Um, let's, you know, I picked that because that produces an incredible amount of mourning in human beings when somebody near them dies. And if you ever had somebody near you die, you know that that is one of the most sickening, most disgusting, most hopeless feelings you will ever, ever fear, feel. It's, it's the weirdest, grossest feeling in the whole world when somebody close to you dies. And, and you, you feel that feeling, you experience that death, and the result of it is you grieve and you mourn. And years ago, I had a friend of mine who was a pastor. He was preaching and he explained the reason that death produces these just disgusting, heart-wrenching feelings in us. He said that the reason that death is such a foreign and sickening experience for us is that in a sense, we were never meant to experience it. It's true. See, church, God did not create you and me to die. He created us to live forever with him. But then sin entered the picture, and when sin entered the picture, death entered into the picture. Now, of course, that's all part of his sovereign plan, but the reality and the truth is is that you and I were created we're designed to live forever. That's the, that's the design. That's the plan. And so, when, uh, and, and so while there's that old saying that, that death is the most natural part of life, the reality is, is that death is one of the most unnatural things that you will ever experience in all of your life, and that's why it's so horrible and heart-wrenching. But Jesus, again, comes in, and he says, for those of us who have been bought with the blood of Christ, for those of us who are saved, for those of us who are new kingdom citizens, there's actually a blessing. There, there's a comfort that's available to us even when we encounter the most horrible thing of life, which is death. Now watch quickly. Don't turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 54. Watch how the apostle Paul talks about this reality of comfort in the life of believers when death occurs. In 1 Corinthians 15, 54, he says, when the perishable puts on the imperishable. That means when you die. He's talking about the moment of your death. He said, when the perishable puts on the imperishable, and when the mortal puts on immorality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. And he starts talking smack to death. He says, oh death, where is your victory? Oh death, where is your sting? And so the reality and the sad truth is, is that for those folks that are not believers, that have not been changed and forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ, there is a sting in their death. When their death comes, there is a sting there because they've not been forgiven. They, they, they died in their sin. And so when mourning comes, there can be no comfort. But for believers, it's different. For Christians, it's different. Scripture is saying that at the moment of your death, you put off the perishable and you put on the imperishable. That at the moment of your death, you take off the mortal shell and you put on the immortal shell. The scripture is saying that in the moment you breathe your last breath and you pass away from this earth, you enter into the presence of Almighty God and because of that, there is no sting in your death. None. And so because of that reality that death has lost its sting for you and for me who are citizens of God or the new kingdom, then our death, it says, is completely swallowed up in that victory. And so even in the worst moment of your life when you lose someone that you love, there is a comfort that can be found that cannot be experienced anywhere else. I saw it last week. There was a couple last week that I talked to and got to pray with that, that um, had just lost their son. And I, th I think he was in his 20s, and, uh, and he passed away. I want to tell you something, guys. It ripped their heart out. It ripped their heart out. But you could see on their face a difference. You could see it in their eyes, the hope and the comfort 
of the belief and the reality that they'll see their son again. That the, the moment that their son passed away and he breathed his last, then his death was swallowed up in victory. And you saw it on their face. They had access to a comfort that people that are not kingdom citizens simply do not have. That's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, I don't care what you've been through. I don't care what you're going through right now. I don't care what you're going to go through one day. That if you are someone that loves God and is called according to his purpose, that God is at work in and for your good in everything. And there's a comfort for that. And even in your death, this is the promise. It's purchased by the blood of Jesus. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Okay? And so that's the first meaning, that we have access to a comfort that God gives to new kingdom citizens that we cannot experience apart from that. Now, um, let's look at the second meaning of the verse today. The second meaning of the verse is this. Let's read it, Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. He said, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And this is kind of the more um, commonly discussed meaning of this verse. And to get it, you have to understand this. Listen carefully. The Beatitudes are like a chain. And so as we go through this over the next few weeks, remember that. It's like a chain where the first one leads to the second one, and then the second one leads to the first one. And so uh, the first Beatitude, when, when it shows up, it'll result in the second. And when the second one shows up, it'll result in the third. Now, you remember what the first beatitude was. It's blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so without re-preaching the sermon, what that means, she just uses the word for poor. It's uh, patakos or takos, and it means the lowest form of poverty available that, that's possible. Um, you're not takos when you're in college, when you're in college, you're poor, but you're college poor, which means that your dad gave you 100 bucks at the beginning of the month, and when that runs out, you still can like, go to your buddy and ask for, you know, to eat his food or to find coins in your couches and go to, and go to uh, McDonald's or whatever. You're poor, but you're not completely and totally destitute. And that's the word that Jesus uses. Think a child on the side of the road with absolutely no ability whatsoever to provide for himself. Jesus says when you realize that that's how you are spiritually, when you realize that because of your sin and God's holiness that you have absolutely no ability to save yourself, then that's the people that are gonna get to go to heaven. And so realizing that this is a chain, that it starts with a person, a kingdom citizen, is absolutely impoverished in their spirit, then the result of that is when they realize their impoverished spirit because of their sin, the result of that is that they'll mourn over their sin. And so that's the second beatitude. That's what most folks believe is that Jesus is making reference here to mourning over their sin. So if a person realizes their spiritual poverty because of their sinfulness, then it produces a real genuine mourning over sin. Now listen, look, look carefully, uh, 2 Corinthians 7, 9. I wanna show you what Paul does because he talks about two different kinds of mourning over sin, and I wanna make sure you know which kind of mourning Jesus is talking about. Because Paul says there's two kinds of ways you can mourn over sin. Jesus is only talking about one. And so let me read this to you, 2 Corinthians 7, 9. Paul says this. He says, as it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. Paul says, I'm rejoicing because you were grieved over your sin and it resulted in you turning from your sin, you repented. He said, for you felt a godly grief so that you suffered no loss through us. Now look at verse 10. <clears throat> he says, for godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. And so Paul says this, listen carefully. He said, when you sin, there's one of two ways that you're gonna respond. You're gonna respond in wor uh, worldly grief, and then you're gonna respond in godly grief. And let me tell you the difference between the two. Let's talk about worldly grief. For a second, what that looks like. Worldly sorrow over your sin. Let's say, for instance, that you went uh, to a party. And just, it was a dinner party or fraternity party or whatever. And you started to drink. And you drank too much. And you got in your car. And you're driving 
on the way home and you look behind you and there's those lights and your heart sinks. You pull over, the police officer tests you, you're, um, you're above the legal limit and he writes you a DWI ticket, hands it to you and puts you in the back of your car, or his car rather. And in that moment, you begin to grieve. It hits you that you're going to have to tell your parents or that you're going to have to tell your, your husband or your wife. It hits you that that moment, that one mistake is going to be on your background check for the rest of your life. For any job application you ever have from now until Jesus comes back, that thing is going to be on there. It hits you that it's the dumbest thing you literally have ever done in your entire life. And in that moment, you begin to grieve. But then that's where it ends. That your grief really has everything to do with the consequences of your sin. More than you're grieving the sin itself. Paul describes that as worldly grief or worldly sorrow. And, and the scripture teaches us that there's no comfort that is promised when you have worldly grief. That's grief over the consequences. The other kind of sorrow over sin is godly sorrow. That's what the Bible calls it. Godly grief. Godly sorrow. This is what it would look like. That you go to that same party, you, you, you drink too much, you, you get in the car, you drive home, you get the DWI, and the grief begins to set in. But the difference is your grief has less to do with the consequences of your sin and has more to do with the sin itself. You're not grieved so much primarily over the consequences of your sin. You're grieved over the sin. It's grieving you that you were not controlled by the Holy Spirit, but that you were controlled by a substance. There's a grief in your heart that as a believer, you're called to display the glory of God. But at that party that night, you did not display the glory of God. It grieves you that, that there were people there that knew you were a Christian and you were a horrible witness that night to the, to the love and, and the grace and the life of God. And your grief is more over the sin itself, more so than it is the consequences of your sin. And so you turn from that sin and you say, I'm never gonna put myself in that situation ever again. Okay, that is the difference between the two. One type of sorrow is sorrow over the consequences. That's worldly sorrow, wor worldly grief, worldly mourning. And the other type of sorrow is sorrow over the sin itself. And that is godly mourning. And then Paul tells us this in 2 Corinthians 7.10. He says, godly grief produces, godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret. And then he says, worldly grief produces Death. And so if all you care about is the consequences of your sin, there's only one end to that, and that's death. There is no comfort. But then when there's a real godly grief, when there is mourning over the sin itself, it says it brings about a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. The point is, is there is a comfort awaiting you at the end of mourning your sin that you cannot experience any other way. And that's what Jesus is saying when he says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. He's saying, blessed are those. The highest level of happiness as a new kingdom citizen you can experience is when you mourn your sin. Because God will step into that story and he will bring a comfort that only comes on the other side of that mourning. And so that brings a question, okay? What does this mourning look like then? Okay, I'm, Jesus is saying that there's a blessing and, and a comfort waiting to me when I mourn my sin. What does that mean? What does that look like? Do you think that Jesus is saying that we should, as Christians, we should feel bad about our sin when he says mourn? When he says mourn over your sin, do you think he's saying that, that our sin ought to bother us? You think maybe he's saying when we should mourn over our sin that when we sin we go, man, that's wrong. I'm never doing that again. What does he mean when he says mourn? over your sin. Well, let's look at one last time. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Look at the word mourn there. There's nine words in the New Testament that get translated into mourn. There's nine different individual Greek words that all get translated into mourning. And the word 
One of the nine, the specific one that Jesus uses is key. It's critical because it helps us understand what this mourning over sin is supposed to look like. Okay, so of the nine Greek words for mourn, the one that Jesus uses is the Greek word pantheo. It's the Greek word pantheo. And that word that Jesus uses, pantheo, represents the deepest, most heartfelt, most sincere sorrow that a human being can experience. That's the word he chose right there. It's a word that was most often used for the way somebody grieved when they lost a loved one. He uses it intentionally. And I, um, I've had a couple of people, really more like a handful of people that I was really close to pass away. And so I've experienced pantheo grief a couple of times. But more importantly, I've, I've seen it a couple of times. And I think seeing it in others was even harder. My mom um, and my aunt, they were just incredibly close. They, they weren't just sisters, but they were identical twins. And they, <laughs> they were so ridiculously close. I want to show you a picture of them when they were little, just to give you an idea. That's them. That's like in 48, I think it was. And uh, I have absolutely no idea which one's my mom. I can't tell. Um, but they, they just adored each other. You can, you can bring that down. You know, to give you an idea of how close they were, true story. And I'm going to tell you two things, and one of them you'll kind of believe, and one of them you'll think, that's just weird. But get this is 1940s, man, so just hang with them, not 40s and 50s. But um, they were so incredibly close that the first day that they were ever apart was on my aunt's wedding night. That's the first day in their whole, since conception that they were ever separated. My uncle used to joke about his wedding night because he was, you know, he was at, at his honeymoon on the first night waiting to do the things that people do on the first night of their honeymoon, and, and he couldn't. He had to wait because my Aunt Sharon was just on the bed weeping because it was the first day in her whole life that she'd been away from my, my mom. And um, they were so close, true story, that the, not only was that the first day that they'd ever um, been apart, but that was the first day that they ever wore something different. Um, their mom just dressed them the same, like in that picture. And all through college, they dressed the same every single day. And they wore a different dress on, on my aunt's wedding day. That's how close they were. But in 1999, um, when my aunt was, I think, in her mid-50s, um, she died in a car accident. <laughs> And I was over at my sister's house when I got the news. My cousin called me and told me. And interestingly, my mom was on the way to my sister's house. She was going to be there in about 30 minutes. And this was really before she had a cell phone. And so um, I, it hit me that I was going to have to be the one to tell her. And so my mom walked in. And I said, Mom, I need you to sit down. And she saw the look on my face. She said, what? I said, just sit down. And her eyes got real big, and I said, Mom, um, Aunt Sharon was killed in a car accident. And when I said that, there was a sound that came out of her that I have never heard before or since come out of another human being. It was this low, guttural wail of desperation, and I've never heard anything like it. She started screaming my dad's name. My father's legal name is Johnny. Nobody called him Johnny. Everybody called him John. I'd never heard my mom call him Johnny. She starts screaming out, Johnny, Johnny, Johnny. No, no, screaming in anguish. I don't really remember much after that, but. That is the word that Jesus uses. That's pentheo grief. And that's the word that Jesus uses. He said, blessed are those who pentheo mourn over their sin. For they will be the ones that are comforted. Okay, Jesus is saying to us, church, listen, that when you sin, you grieve over that sin to the level that you would grieve over the death of somebody that you love. Jesus is saying this, is, your sin shouldn't just bother you. 
Jesus is telling us that your sin shouldn't trouble you or annoy you. He is saying that your sin ought to produce in you a mourning, a wail, a guttural cry of desperation like nothing else will in your life but death. And Jesus says that when God sees that kind of mourning over sin, he steps in. And he brings us a comfort that the world can never know. And if you're here today and you're like, Matt, I'm I'm a Christian, but I don't don't know if I I grieve over sin like that. I'm I'm a Christian, Matt, but I don't know that I've I've grieved over my sin like that. I'm going to tell you that this is what you need to do. If you don't hear anything I, I say today, I want you to hear this. I don't know what your sin is. I don't know what your struggles are. I don't know where you fall short of the glory of God. I had a list here, but I'm not going to waste your time on the list. You know what it is. If you're here today and you're like, Matt, I don't know if I am mourning like that over the sin of my life, then then what needs to happen for you to see pantheo mourning occur over your sin is you have to go to the cross. You have to go to the cross. The only way, I'm telling you, the only way that you will ever mourn your sin the way that Jesus is talking about in this verse is you turn your eyes to the cross. And when you look to the cross, you'll see Jesus there. You'll see Jesus there. And this, this man, this God in the flesh, the only one that never sinned, the only innocent man, and when you look to the cross, you'll see him there. He was stripped naked. He was tortured. He was beaten to a bloody pulp within an inch of his life. When you look to the cross, you'll see your Savior there, and you'll see that nails were driven through his hands, that nails were driven through his feet, and that a crown of thorns was crushed upon his head. And as you look at the cross, as you stand at the foot of the cross and you see your Savior, something will hit you like a ton of bricks. Jesus went through all of that for me. Jesus went through all of that for me. And when that hits you, you'll know what to do. You'll mourn. One of the biggest changing moments of my life when I was in college and I was running after all the stuff that the hashtag blessed people are saying brings you blessing because I wanted to find out for myself if it was true. And I went after it and I got a lot of it. No, no Lamborghinis, but got some waffles. And I was miserable. And I remember it was a night, and I won't bore you with the whole story, but I was a member of the night that the Holy Spirit was just speaking to me so loud that that is not who I am any longer, and I mourned my sin, I grieved my sin, I ugly cried over my sin because of what my sin had done to my Lord and Savior, and I want you to know something, folks, it changed me, it changed me. You know, mourning over your sin does not mean that you beat yourself up over your sin. I think mourning over your sin simply means to look at your sin in light of what your sin cost Jesus. And when you look at what your sin, when you look at your sin in the light of what it cost the Lord, then then it'll hit you. And you'll mourn it. And that's when the comfort comes. I think and I fear that we're a generation of Christians that stop mourning our sin. I fear that we become a generation of Christians that kind of feels bad about it, that we're bothered by it, but we've not come to the place where we're pantheo mourning over our sin. And Jesus is telling us, look, that's not a good thing because there is a level of satisfaction and there's a level of happiness and there's a level of comfort and there's a level of blessing that can only be experienced on the other side of that pantheo mourning. Some of you are here today, listen, some of you are here today and you have a sin in your life that you can't shake. I'm just telling you, I know it. You've got, you've got something in your life that, that, man, it really bothers you, 
but you can't shake it. It keeps popping up in your life over and over again. One of the reasons that that might be happening is because you feel bad about your sin, but you aren't mourning your sin. And then when you, what happens is when you actually look to the cross and you see what he did, for that sin, then the godly grief begins to well up in you. And when the godly grief begins to well up in you, you think to yourself, the last thing in the world I wanna do is fall into a sin again that put my Savior on the cross. And then you begin to walk in obedience. And when you walk in obedience, you experience a peace and a comfort and a joy that you didn't even know was possible. Some of you are believers, you understand forgiveness, but there's sin in your life, in your past, and you still carry guilt about it. You still carry shame about it. You know everything the Bible says, but you still, it's just right under the surface, and you're carrying that with you all the time. I'm telling you, listen, that might be because that sin bothers you, but you've never come to the place where you've allowed that sin to grieve you. You know, too many Christians, I've realized, and I see this in myself, too many Christians want to jump from sinning to forgiveness, and Jesus is saying there's a step that you've skipped. Too many of us, we, we want to go from crying, from sinning to crying tears of joy over our forgiveness, and what Jesus is saying is, is there's sin, and then he wants you to stop right there and go to the cross and cry tears of mourning and then experience the joy of forgiveness. That's where the blessing can be found. Jesus didn't say blessed are those who forgiven. He said blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. You know, I'm almost done here. I got a couple more sentences and I'm gonna land the plane, but I, it hit me as I was thinking about this that this verse, as weird as it sounds when you first read it, when you think about it, it really makes all the sense in the world. You've got a heavenly dad that's looking at his kids, and he's saying, when you have a godly sorrow over your sin, I want to comfort you. And when you think about it, it makes all the sense in the world. I've got three kids that are world-class sinners, man. Gold medal sinners. And here's what I found, just as a sinful, earthly dad, that when they sin, and they're less concerned about the consequences of their sin, and they're more concerned about the sin itself, when I see that they're actually grieved over the fact that their sin was against the Lord, when I see that, the last thing I want to do is punish them. I don't even want to discipline them. All in the world I want to do is comfort them. God's sons and God's daughters that are comfortable in their sin, he disciplines. But God's sons and daughters that mourn in their sin, he comforts them. And the story of the prodigal son maybe shows it best. This kid went and got a PhD in sinning in the faraway land. Scripture said that he was in a pig pen and he came to his senses. Listen, almost done. This is what he said. He said, God, or rather he said, I have sinned in the sight of heaven and dad in your sight. Do you, do you hear the morning there? He's coming up with a speech he wants to give to his dad before he comes home and he says, dad, I have sinned in your sight and I've, in, I've sinned in the sight of heaven. He could care less about the consequences of his sin. He's not saying, oh, I blew the money. Oh, I did all this stupid stuff. Oh, all this bad stuff's happened to me. The only thing he cared about, the only thing he grieved was the fact that he'd sinned against his dad and sinned against God. And so when he came home, the Bible said, Jesus said that when he was still a long way off, the father saw him and had compassion on him and ran to him and threw his arms around him, wrapped his robe around him and threw him a party. Didn't punish him. Didn't discipline him. He just comforted him. And that's what's waiting for you today on the other side of morning. Let's pray.
want you to invite you to bow your head and close your eyes for just a second. And as the band comes forward before we sing, I'd love to give you an opportunity today. If you're here, and as I was preaching and you're listening to the word of God, if you if you sense that maybe God was calling you to himself, if, if you sense that, that maybe the Lord is leading you to make him his you uh, his his make you the Lord, his Lord and Savior. Forgive you of your sins. Adopt you into his family. The best way you know how to do that right now, just ask him, say, Lord, I trust in you. As my Lord, I trust in you as my Savior. Please forgive me of my sin. Scripture said he will make you his son. He'll make you his daughter. He wipes you clean, restores you back into the relationship that you were created for. Maybe some of you are here today and, and you've... You're walking in sin, but you, you haven't been mourning it, and you sense that the Holy Spirit is leading you today to come to that place, that you want more than anything the comfort of God because you're tired of the nonsense. Then here's the prayer that you pray. You say, God, help me to mourn this sin. And you go to the cross after church tonight, this week, go to the cross, open up your Bible, Think about it. Dwell on it. Whatever you got to do, walk to the foot of the cross and see him there and you'll know what to do. He's waiting on you. He cannot wait to run to you and throw his arms around you. Father, I love you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for its power and its clarity, Lord. I thank you that you are a dad that runs after his sons and his daughters. Not to harm us, but to comfort us. I pray that we would rejoice and worship you right now for that reality and that truth, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, church, let's stand together.